Hi, I'm Baxter Pitt, and welcome to Studio N, your McKinney ISD talk show. On today's episode, we remember the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President Kennedy with a very special guest who was at Dealey Plaza on that fateful early afternoon. We're also going to talk about healthy living on the campus of Wolford Elementary, and we'll meet some McGowan Elementary citizens with community outreach on their mind. That's all coming up next, right here on Studio M. Welcome back to Studio M. Um, it's been sort of a strange day for me. We're filming this on a Tuesday. Uh, this is actually going to be my last day of school um, for the week, which seems odd. I'm actually going uh, to the Texas Thespians Festival over for the next four days, actually, um, which is a huge theater convention that happens every year. I'm actually on the state board for the organization, so throughout this past year, I've been you know, planning all various different aspects of it. Um, and it's finally coming to a head, and so I'm going to be spend the, spending the next four days uh, at the Dallas Convention Center right here in Dallas. And uh, speaking of this great city, 50 years ago, on Friday, November 22, 1963, the 35th President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, was shot and killed by an assassin as his motorcade paraded through Dealey Plaza in Dallas. This tragedy has been described by historians as a moment that changed America forever. McKinney North social studies teacher, Tommy Sills, witnessed the shocking event as a very young boy that day. We are privileged to hear his recollections and thoughts, and we also have McKinney High social studies teacher, Mike Bruck, with us to discuss the effect of this incident on our country. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sills, I guess to start off with you, uh, first off, uh, where do you teach, what subject do you teach, and how long have you been there? Uh, I'm at McKinney North High School, and I teach uh, U.S. History 11th grade, and I've been there six years. Right. Uh, Mr. Bruck, same questions for you. I'm at uh, McKinney High School. I teach American History, just like uh, Coach Sills here. Uh, and this is my 28th year in McKinney ISD. My whole career has been here. All right. Uh, Mr. Sills, you have a, a very personal connection to the JFK assassination, uh, as you were on the grassy knoll when he was shot. Uh, if you just tell us a little bit about that, your experience on that day. Well, actually, I wasn't on the grassy knoll. Uh, I was at the corner of Maine and Houston, which is across from the reflecting pool, as he made the turn at Maine and Houston, then the turn at Elm Street. And the, uh, just to give you an idea, if you, if you were looking back over to the right, that would be where the sixth floor museum is, or actually the depository. I see. <clears throat> um, what was your initial reaction, uh, I guess, whenever you know, the events started to unfold? Uh, it was pretty exciting, first of all, to know that I was going to get to go see him. Uh, a couple of instances were taking place. My dad knew, you know, how much I loved history and how much I really liked John F. Kennedy and some of the things that he had done. Um, and uh, being able to know that I was going to be able to go downtown and watch the motor cab. My dad worked pretty close to downtown. So they knew it was going to be on November the 22nd, and uh, the problem is it had rained and it was raining very heavily that morning so we're like not sure if we're even going to be able to get to go but then to find out that we're going to be able to go is pretty exciting I see that's um that's very neat um and so i guess walk me through i guess kind of what you're thinking uh you know as the shot is fired and these kind of the panic sets in well first of all you could just to kind of go back to where the motorcade was it was coming down uh, I guess it would be coming west, and uh, it was going to turn right in front of us at Maine and Houston, and you could hear the crowds. I mean, the, where I was at it, there wasn't that huge of a crowd. I don't know why, but, you know, the, the part of the motorcade as he was coming down through downtown Dallas, uh, it was getting louder and louder, and you could tell they were getting closer. You could hear the motorcycles. There were motorcycles in front of the limo, and uh, so... Uh, I kind of moved around the corner where I could maybe get a, you know, I'm nine years old, so I'm having a hard time seeing, so I'm kind of moving around looking to try to see if I could see him, and here he comes, you know. Uh, as he made the turn, I mean, really, to be honest with you, I could have stepped off the curb and touched him on the shoulder. That's how close I had gotten to him. Um, and as he made the turn, I remember 
you know, uh, his wife being in the very pretty pink outfit. It was uh, very radiant looking. So it was, it was exciting. I mean, there he is right there, you know. It's kind of like seeing a celebrity. I see. <clears throat> um, and I guess uh, whenever, you know, the, the shots kind of rang out, I don't think it's anyone's initial reaction when you hear that sort of loud noise that mm -hmm. it's a gunshot, no. or especially that someone would be shooting at the president. Right. And the whole motorcade had to make the pass on us uh, that to make the turn at Elm. So as he made the turn at Elm, we're still waiting for the motorcade to pass by. And of course you hear what you think is a shot or whatever. And uh, people are yelling, uh, somebody, I can't believe somebody's shooting firecrackers. And then uh, I think I remember somebody saying, no, that's just a motorcycle backfiring. That was the first shot. And then at the second shot, people knew that it was a, a gunshot. And it was, it was panic after that, it was pandemonium. Um, you could definitely tell that the second shot was, you know, a gunshot or a shot of some sort. I see. I see. Very interesting stuff. Um, Mr. Bruck, I guess kind of transitioning uh, more into, you know, the man and the president. Uh, if you could just give us a little bit of more background information. Uh, who was JFK? Well, he's the son of a very wealthy family. Uh, his father was, uh, was very wealthy, made his money mostly in the 20s, a little bit in the 30s, had been... Uh, ambassador to Great Britain uh, for a while under uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Um, in World War II, he had served in the Navy, and he'd, he'd be, he's, he's viewed, or his actions are viewed very heroically. Uh, how the incident started, probably not very heroic. His, his uh, patrol boat gets sliced in two by a Japanese destroyer. But then after that, uh, everything is totally heroic. He will rescue his, uh, his crew. One of the crew he'll uh, drag by a lifesaver, uh, belt, the, the crewman will have the life vest on, Kennedy will put the belt in between his teeth and swim the guy mile and a half a mile to the shore of a little island nearby uh, and make sure that everyone gets rescued. Then while they're on the island, uh, he'll swim out every night treading water for four or five hours at a time waiting for a submarine to come by. They're pretty sure that somebody's going to look for him. Uh, he does this uh, numerous times until they finally are rescued and it's, <coughs> it's incredible. Uh, he basically gives his body up for his crew and for them to be saved. From that point on, he has terrible back problems. Uh, he'll have spinal surgery while he's in the Senate. Uh, he's in the Senate for about eight years before he gets elected. Uh, he'll have spinal surgery, try to repair what he can, but he's constantly in pain. Uh, so it's, it's a fascinating story before he ever even gets to the Oval Office. Uh, uh, and then once he runs for president, he'll run against Richard Nixon, who was the sitting vice president at the time. And uh, as we were talking before, it, uh, it was amazing. The, the campaign itself was a little different. Uh, Kennedy is able to harness the star power of Hollywood. Uh, they will support him, and you Frank Sinatra singing ads for him. I mean, that's pretty cool. Uh, and then uh, in the debates, this is the, the first televised debates in American political history, uh, Kennedy against Nixon. And the, uh, as we were talking before we came on the air, one of the fascinating things is uh, if you watch the debate, you felt pretty strong that Kennedy won because, uh, as Tommy was saying, you could see the beads of sweat on Nixon's brow, and he, he'd refused makeup Nixon had. Uh, not a very manly thing to wear makeup. Kennedy had makeup, uh, looked cool, calm, collected. Uh, but the people that listened on radio thought that Nixon had won the debate. So television has a very important role in Kennedy, uh, and he'll win in the election. It's a very, very close election, one of the closest in American history. Uh, and so Kennedy comes into the White House uh, with a narrow victory, but, but a victory. And uh, from there, his agenda is going to be a little bit, uh, a little bit more clouded. I see. Um, I guess if you could kind of discuss uh, what that agenda was, what some of his major accomplishments were uh, in his short time as president. Well, it's, it's a mixed bag. Unfortunately for him, and I think this is where we have the, the idea of what could have been. And eventually we get the Camelot uh, link out of that. But uh, he comes into office and he has these dreams, but he really doesn't get a whole lot accomplished while he's the president. The, probably the, the big, biggest signature domestic achievement he gets, he gets it through executive orders, the Peace Corps. Uh, I mean, he's, he says all the right things on civil rights, but he's not able to get a civil rights bill passed. Uh, his own party was kind of blocking that. Uh, Southern Democrats weren't in favor of that. And he didn't want to push it too much because if you push it too much, you don't have their support for the next election. Um, he does stare down two southern governors, Ross Burnett of Mississippi uh, and George Wallace of Alabama. 
and he'll basically do what, uh, what Eisenhower had done in Little Rock, where he'll use federal police forces or marshals at this uh, instance uh, to guarantee that, that uh, integration is allowed and followed following Supreme Court decisions. But there really isn't a whole lot you can hang your hat on domestically that way. Um, in fact, uh, one of the stories that they recently had the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, one of the stories that John Lewis told that uh, he was one of the speakers then and one of the speakers this time, but one of the stories John Lewis told was that before the march, Kennedy tried to talk Dr. King out of it and said, you know, this could lead to riots. I'm not sure this is what we want to do. I'm not sure this is how we achieve the change that you want. And of course, Dr. King, you know, we're doing it. And then, uh, according to John Lewis, after the march, Kennedy invited him to the White House. So like, yeah, this is a great idea. It was wonderful. <laughs> so, you know, it's, he's, a, he's a politician, you know, and, uh, uh, but that's about it domestically. Now, he will push through some tax cuts, uh, which is interesting because not generally favored by his party or his, his younger brother, Teddy, a senator from Massachusetts at the time, but he will get those passed, uh, personal and uh, corporate taxes. So he does get that, and then uh, foreign policy-wise, it's, uh, it's also a mixed bag. He comes into office, he wants to uh, basically create what we would call now a detente with the Soviet Union. He wants to work more closely with them, not be so confrontational as Eisenhower had been, and then it instantly also falls apart. Uh, the, the Bay of Pigs invasion fails where we support Cuban mercenaries, uh, the invasion fails, it looks bad on Kennedy. Uh, a few months later, the East Germans build the Berlin Wall, and Kennedy does nothing. The Germans were, okay, you're not going to support us. Uh, and then in Vietnam, he's going to actually escalate the number of troops that are sent into Vietnam uh, up to about 16,000. And so it, it's a mixed bag. And, and I think that's why we have this idea afterward of, and I think Hamelot actually fits here, of what might have been. Because his dreams ended up being very different than his reality. Um. Getting back to the uh, assassination, um, Mr. Sills, uh, how do you think that America and the world perceived Dallas after the assassination? And how did this um, event kind of uh, develop a, a sort of stigma um, with the city? Well, I think first of all, when he when he came here, I don't, I don't know if you've ever noticed on some of the PBS shows, but the uh, they had you know signs and posters, propaganda posters for him treason. Uh, talking, and I think that all stems a lot with like Mr. Brooke was talking about the racial discrimination and him wouldn't get to pass the Civil Rights of 1964 passed. Uh, a lot of people in the South, you know, the South was slavery, the South was basically set up in a situation that there was still a lot, still a lot of people that were very bigots, prejudiced, and they didn't like Kennedy because he was really pushing the idea of uh, integration, the idea of getting rid of racial discrimination, stuff like that. So, but when he did come here and he was assassinated here, I think I really think it left a very negative stigma uh, to to, to I, and even in today's society. Uh, I think that Dallas is perceived of of don't go to Dallas if you're president of the United States because you you know, you know you're going to get shot. I see. Um, <clears throat> and Mr. Breck, uh, this this stigma that mis that Mr. Sills is discussing. Do you think? Um, that Dallas has overcome it at this point in time, you know, as we approach the 50th anniversary of this event? Well, I, I hope so, and I think, I think we probably have. And I got, when, when I was a, a young school child in the, in the late 60s, and I remember we moved to a couple of different places, people would ask, you know, where are you from? I'd say Dallas, and i tell you, people, the first thing people would say, oh, you killed Kennedy. I mean, it was tough on little kids. I mean, you know, I wasn't there. I didn't know anything about it, but that was the image that people had. And, you almost hate to say it, but I think the Cowboys fix that. I mean, the Cowboys have become the image, the dominant image of Dallas now. And I think, you know, them winning Super Bowls and, and uh, uh, bringing the region together or whatever, I think helped take a lot of the people's minds off of it. But I also think, you know, the, the Sixth Floor Museum, in, a, in an odd kind of way, uh, by Dallas saying, you know what, we're going to remember this, we're going to remember this in a respectful, honorable way, uh, and our participation in it, I think it's also helped lessen the stigma. To own up to it. Right. Yeah, basically. I definitely, definitely agree with that. Um, so on to uh, conspiracy theories, I guess, uh, which are very popular. You know, anytime you talk about the Kennedy assassination, they're bound to come up. Uh, so I guess I want to ask both of you, uh, do you believe in any, cons any conspiracy theories? Do you think that anyone holds more weight than the others? 
I think if you look, there's about seven different conspiracy theories. Uh, I don't want to even think that we have a conspiracy within our government that took place during that time. But I do believe that uh, because of the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis and all the things that were going on, like Mr. Bruck was talking about during that time, I cannot believe that Cuba didn't have something to do with Castro. Uh, maybe the mob had something to do with it. They talked about Kennedy actually dating one of uh, Sam Giacano's girlfriends or something at that time. So, that, as a matter of fact, his brother had warned him, you know, you're getting into some pretty heavy water here dating a, a mob boss's girlfriend. You know, of course, this was supposed to be behind the scenes. But there are probably three or four that I, that I think are pretty relevant as far as could be conspiracy theories. Well, and you throw in that, uh, that Oswald was a communist. And I think that helps reinforce yeah. the, at least the possibility. A pro-Castro guy. Right. Pro-Castro guy. Uh, he had already <coughs> tried to assassinate uh, a, a right-wing American general, General Wheeler. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I think it's possible. But you don't want to believe that, you know, and you certainly don't want to believe the, the Oliver Stone type that it was from within the U.S. government. But, uh, I, you know, for me, the, hard, the hardest part for me is, is that Oswald was able to fire numerous shots off in a very short amount of time accurately at that distance. And I, for me, that's just the hard part. I, I don't know how I can get past that. I see. Um, as a final question, I just want to ask uh, both of you, what do you think JFK, what does JFK mean to you personally, and what do you feel that he means to other adults uh, who grew up during that time period? Well, I know as far as my parents, I mean, they, uh, they looked up to him because he was young. He was he was a very attractive uh, man. Uh, he was 43 years old. He was the youngest president ever elected. He had a beautiful wife. Talked about Camelot. I mean, it was it was a perfect like Mr. Brook said. It basically was a, a very uh, personal situation, and it felt like he was talking to you, not talking away from you. He would you know. Uh, I just really believe that our our nation would have been different had he not been assassinated. I think some things would have changed. I don't think it would have been in, in Vietnam as long, even though he inherited that problem. Um, I just really think that uh, that was a very transitional time for us in U.S. history, and, and I really believe if he had been able to maybe get the Civil Rights Bill passed earlier and some of the stuff that he wanted to do for the elderly and some of the insurance and some of the things that he was wanting to do, um, I think it would have been different. Um, I just... And, I, I'm not a, and I'm, a, I'm not an LBJ fan, so I just don't believe that LBJ did that good of a job uh, once Kennedy was, was out of the, uh, you know, out of the scene. I see. And Mr. Bruck? Well, I think it's the promise of, of what might have been. You know, we really don't know. Uh, he was in the third year of his presidency when, when he was assassinated in November 63. He was actually only one year away from the next election. And in fact, that's part of the reason he was in Texas, to help shore up support. Uh, and it just... I don't know, the, the more you study about him and the, the struggles that he, that he had, and uh, it just, it's, you, you wish you could have seen a little bit more and maybe a little bit longer, but you know, we're, we only have him for the time that we have him. And uh, I think for me, it's really the promise of what might have been. I see. <clears throat> All right. We need to take a quick break, but when we return, it's time to get healthy with Wolford Elementary. <laughs> 